And we are back. We are now beginning our first conversation and joining us to talk about uh, several political issues is um, attorney at law, politician, um, Daryl Bradley. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure and good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, politics is probably uh, in the front of everybody's mind, yeah. um, especially with all the recent events. But um, perhaps we can start with getting a bit of a reaction um, or your reaction to um, the events that took place yesterday. Um, we saw, of course, a big um, protest and rally in the city of uh, the opposition. So um, being that you um, are upon our have been a politician um, for the incumbent um, United Democratic Party. I was just wondering um, what sort of your reaction to yesterday was? Well, I think, first of all, it is a good sign whenever our political process and people involved mobilize. I think the plurality of our society is very positive. And if we can show a strong and vibrant opposition, which is something that I think is needed in a democratic space, then that's a good thing. I also think in relation to the specific issue that would have been raised, the issue of integrity in government, the issue of stamping out corruption, that is something that needs to be protested. And that is something I think that if an opposition champions that, if a union champions that, if anybody champions that, that is something that should be celebrated because I think that that would be one principle in government that is universal. Every Belizean should want integrity in government and they should want a government that is free of corruption. Yeah. You know, we were, we were talking during the break and I think it's, it's a great opening discussion um, for, for looking at what is happening today. Yeah. In this country, people are feeling very frustrated with what they're seeing. And, and we essentially have to wait until the next election to decide what we will do as a result of that. Um, but it seems very clear that the power dynamics of elected officials and the electorate, yeah. there is a great disconnect. And of people course. no longer are, uh, they don't have a political party that is pushing a message or an ideology that they can subscribe of to course. and feel hope in. Yeah. They only have personalities. Yeah. And then when you're looking at personalities, naturally they're human beings, <laughs> um, so you will find flaws. And, and it really just becomes a very challenging time yeah. for people in the country to see what the future can potentially hold. Well, I think that, Sorry. Go ahead. I think that that is the sense that I get from a lot of people. And the reaction that I would say with respect to that is we need politics. Politics is a necessary yeah. evil, but our political system is something and the conversation about that is something that we construct. One mm -hmm. of the things that I had said previously is we spend a lot of time in this country speaking just about politicians, rather about issues which can inspire people. For mm -hmm. example, if we were to debate about what kind of country we want, what kind of programs or policies our government should support, and we divide that along political lines so that we would have, as you were talking about earlier, we would have a discussion really about substance. That's where you inspire people. I am. I look at the debates that are going on in the United States and some of the things that they talk, for example, Bernie Sanders talking about universal health care, yeah. talking about free education. So you can actually see in your leader a vision of where you want to move a country forward. And I think the absence of that will lead people into frustration because they will see conversations about corruption, conversations about you did this and I did that. And anyone would be tuned off of that because them, it's not about their reality or it's not about how do we empower people within our community. You know, you're right because I think that as the conversation is primarily about corruption yeah. and what has taken place is that uh, when the PUP administration was voted out over a decade ago, the, the main platform of the current administration was an anti-corruption platform. Yes. And then here we are now staring in the face of what is blatant corruption. And, and I can say that without having all the valid proof yeah, yeah. in front of me. Um, because we can see how things work within the government, uh, uh, even as outsiders. So how is anyone to trust at this point in time that when any politician yeah. steps forward and says, whether it's a machete, whether it's uh, regulations that will come, how can they trust that? Yeah. Well, the first thing that I would say is never trust politicians. <laughs> I mean, that's a thing that's a universal kind of principle. I remember that somebody told me a long time ago that uh, people have a natural aversion to snakes and politicians. Mm -hmm. So don't put your hope in any person. The 
thing that I really kind of say is important here is, can people who recognize right, can people who recognize the moment in time that our country faces, can those people step forward and put forward things which would be very concrete and which would usher in change? For example, there's a significant amount of momentum, I think, in the country right now, both in Belize and with our diaspora community. There are lots of people lighting up social media. There are lots of people talking right now about political personalities, what's going on, their frustration with what's going on. Can we, as a people, being mature, move beyond that and say, OK, then we need this in our society. We need reform in our society. And can we put forward a series of legislation or practices or whatever that would bring reform? Because I think if we can get the leadership question in our country right, our country can go on to a trajectory of significant prosperity. The reality is that we are making the same mistakes over and over and over again, because the sad reality is that our system of government is broken because our system of government does not have sufficient checks and balances to keep any political party in government at bay so that the will of the people can be represented. But is that entirely right, though? Because we do have oversight bodies. We do have no, systems we do. We in do place. Not. But they do require the political will for mm -hmm. them to function effectively. So it's not always that what's on paper mm -hmm. is, is, some of it is old, but some of it is, is, is quite capable of, it's capable of helping us to fight off some of the corrupt practices that we do see. But it still goes back to those who are in leadership mm -hmm. having the will to execute it properly. So we still go back to the personality. It is the personality, but I think uh, the laws are important. Okay. If we have good laws on the books, we do have some, but if we have good laws on the books which are comprehensive, mm -hmm. that will encourage good leadership. For example, I talk to a lot of people within Belizean society. I have a lot of friends who are involved in politics from both sides. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always hear about people who I would say, hey, you know what, I'd love for you to run for elected office. People always say, you know what, I won't get involved because the system yeah. is not mm -hmm. yeah. level. There is too much involvement in money. And what happens is that decent people, people who would have something to contribute, won't get involved. You know, one of the saddest things that I heard over the last month involving all of this debacle is that notwithstanding everything that happened, notwithstanding the fact that many people in our society would look at that and say, you know what, that is wrong. People can actually say that there are no laws to deal with that. So that one of the first things that we need is we need comprehensive, practical campaign finance laws in Belize. Yeah. Because if you track where monies are coming in and where monies are being paid out to, you will have a balanced playing field. This is yeah. something that many countries in the world struggle with. This is, country, this is something that individual politicians struggle with. And I think if we can put forward legislation about that, yeah. then we can have a change, a fundamental change. I mean, one of the things that I did over this weekend yeah. is sat down, read laws in other countries, and I drafted a law that deals with campaign finance. Yeah. And it deals not only with specific prohibitions, but it deals with ethics in campaign finance finance. It requires the registration of political parties. It requires the monthly reporting of all campaign finance contributions received by political parties. And you have to account for how you're spending that. Every month, as a business owner, I have to file social security. I have to file income tax. I have to file GST. Every month, I have to do that. Mm -hmm. Why is it that a political party is any different? If we put in place very specific and very comprehensive legislation, I think that we can have a change. And I think that we can use this moment when people are very angry, when people are very frustrated, to birth something positive. Mm -hmm. If you look at history, many of the great changes in human society has resulted from a time of calamity. Of and if we can look at this and say, you know what, I am so, what I would ask people is that, how frustrated really are you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you are so frustrated to just say, you know what, I want to move to another country, then fine. But if you're so frustrated to say that, you know what, I need change. Yeah. And I need to be a bigger person. And I need to support change. Then that's how we create aspirations, and we create vision, and we create something that is transformative within our society. And because the NTUCB was absolutely right. Only yeah. the people will save the people. And they can, they can do so by uh, raising their voice and keep the pressure going. Yeah. But, but let's step back. You drafted a campaign yeah, finance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah 
uh, regulation yeah. legislation. But let's let's talk about it because you are a member of the United yes. Democratic Party, and and I want to hear from you because. From what we know of you, you've always known this is the path that you want to go. You wanted to to work uh, in in government. You wanted to someday, and you've been very clear about it, uh, be the leader. Um, what what's your impression, and what's been your feedback to your own party about how things have gone? Well, as a person who is a member of the United Democratic Party, and as a Belizean, I have to put on record that I'm disappointed. So that. In all honesty, any person who looks at what's going on, you cannot help but say, you know what? That is not what a decent Belizean would support. This is supposed to be about people, about poverty reduction, about opportunity. And we should not be talking about, and I think we have too much conversations about this, about trying to stop politicians from doing things which everybody recognizes is wrong, if not illegal, unethical. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we need to start talking about change and start talking about policies and start talking about reform. If we are saying that we want to protest, that's good, but it's not sufficient for us to do that. It's sufficient if we're really genuine to say, you know what, we want to talk about solutions. One solution that I see is campaign finance reform. You talk about the political will. This took me two days to draft. We have a solicitor general's office. We have an attorney general's ministry. We have very bright people in government. We have a lot of bright attorneys in our bar association. This is something that can be put together relatively quickly. One of the things that the union talked about also is things like term limits, things yeah. which are very practical and useful to, to promoting a healthy democratic system. You should not have career politicians. I went to City Hall. I served two terms. And people were saying, serve another term. I said, absolutely not. I'm a lawyer, I'm a father, I'm not a politician. And so when you're there, you would go there for the sole purpose of service. And you give your time, and when you give your time, you go away. The best thing I think politicians can do sometimes is leave. Yeah. I actually look at uh, situations in Africa where the programs that they actually give politicians money if they would voluntarily demit office <laughs> so that there's a peaceful transfer of elected power. We actually need to have a lot more conversations about what really we expect of leaders in this country and how we, the people, can have more control over that. And don't, um, do, don't you also think, though, that um, something that we also have to address is, um, you know, you had earlier said that, you know, we do have a broken system. Um, we can pass laws, but do we, is, do we not also have to look at something of sort of uh, examining our political culture in and of itself yeah. to see how it can change? Mm -hmm. Because if this something like this does go into effect, our, uh, like what Marlene said earlier, or going back to what Marlene said, if will it have teeth? Will it be able to work yeah. given what's been entrenched for so long? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do we address issues like that? Because that's something that seems it's going to take you know, a whole long time. You, you were talking about shifting mentalities, yeah. Yeah. Um, almost turning the whole system upside down. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's twofold. One is that we need the legislation in place. Because mm -hmm. without the legislation, you will not encourage well-meaning people to come into leadership posts. The second thing is that, like all things, it will take time. And it is a paradigm shift in many ways within our society to, for people to understand what is the power of their vote. You had indicated earlier, uh, Marlene, that the politicians are really the employees. You work for the people. But that concept is not something that is appreciated or internalized by politicians and by the majority mm -hmm. of people. And we need to have frank conversations about it. The fact that people would sell a vote is something that is shameful. Yeah. And we really need to discuss it, call it out, and say that you need to vote for what is really important, the future of yourself and the future of your society, so that those kind of conversations will take a long time. Okay. But we have to start somewhere. And we have to start with a few pieces, I think, of very necessary legislation. And we need to have specific conversations about what is right in politics. Otherwise, nothing will change. And it's difficult to have specific conversations because it is that there's so many issues. There's so mm -hmm. many things that are not working. When you say people shouldn't take money, yeah. we also know the dire situation that some people live in that 
a hundred, a hundred and fifty. I don't even know what they pay, but whatever they do pay mm. is a lot for them at that given moment. Yeah. Because we have, and you worked in the city, we have pockets in this country where people are experiencing the type of poverty that we can't even imagine. Yeah. And that has been for a very long time. When, when, when Honorable Hyde, and I don't, I'm not making this yeah. political, but it's a valid point. When we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. going into infrastructure, and then I still speak to the director of human services who said that they have, so I can't remember, is it 12 or 20 yeah. social workers, child protection yeah. officers who go out and investigate abuse or neglect. Yeah. It shows where the priorities are, and the priorities has not been the people. Well, the I mean, it's difficult to lump everything together. So but they're all connected. Yeah, they're all connected, and it goes back to a leadership question. The problem in our society is that we do not encourage a system that has leaders who are well-meaning and focus on our problems. Yeah. We do not do that. Our system does not encourage politicians to go in there and say, hey, you know what, we need these kinds of programs. If you ask me, Right now, what is the difference between our two political parties in terms of programs? What Name 10 things, and this is because I am a member of a political party. I've run for a political party. And if you ask me, name 10, name, name 10 things that differentiates one political party from the other in terms of their programs, I can't do that. Yeah. So that the reality is that we have a system that is so convoluted, it does not promote the empowerment of or poor anybody in this society. And if we look at this from the point of view where, you know what, everything is just a mist and we can't do anything, then we will not do anything. So what we should do is pick out the few things that we can do and do those things. I remember when I went to City Hall, lots of problems with City Hall. But you can pick out a few things and say, you know what, this is what we want to focus on. And if you do it, you will have change which is transformative within a society if we get in place legislation right now at this time within a short period of time i would say that it can be done in 30 days but if you we have do that you would have change office, and so you know what it's like to have to raise capital for a campaign yeah do you think and and i pose the same question to the leader of the opposition will, 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 will political parties be interested in passing a regulation that will probably make it harder for them to win an election no because is they want not to pass the legislation. This piece of legislation is very difficult all over the world. I remember when I was reading articles about this over this weekend. You have governments which have been bogged down in debate and so forth. They want that. They want a system where they're not regulated. They want a system where you, Marlene and Gavin, you're frustrated and you would think, hey, you know what, let me just leave it to the politicians because then they will have a sphere that they can rule and deal with all to themselves. If you say that you are really frustrated, then speak out about a particular situation. Lobby for a change. I'm not saying that this is the answer, but at least this starts a yeah. conversation that can move it in the right direction, that can move it into a situation of change. Yeah. This is not something that is very difficult. And if somebody who would say, you know what, I want integrity in government, I want accountability and transparency, let's talk about this. Let's have a conversation of what we can put in place now. And I would say that if we're really serious about it, any political party or any union or any individual who's interested in it, let's sit down and let's talk about it. Let's not be frustrated and angry, but let us see how that anger can lead to something which is positive within our community, which is positive for ourselves and our children. Because this is something I think we've always been here and we've never recognized what the moment is. Yeah. I mean, I look at the news, and if you think about this situation with the Honorable John Saldiver, we've been here many times before, and the reality is that if we want to stop being at this present location, yeah. we have to do things differently as a people and yeah. as a society. And, and you know, I think, valid point, that we have been here before, and I think the way it is discussed so casually is mm. what concerns me the most. I re recall before the evidence was presented in court, it was the Prime Minister himself who said, well, maybe it's campaign financing and we don't have any laws for it. Yes. You have the power to be able to put these laws in place rather than use it as a possible excuse. Yeah. But let me, let me take it back, because there's one question I'm sure people at home are watching and saying, yeah. Okay, Mr. Bradley, 
but you're a part of the United mm -hmm. Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Have you taken this very same passionate plea, this legislation that you've drafted, and taking it, taken it to your party and said, mm -hmm. if you are serious, yeah. if you're paying attention to the people, this is what we yeah. have to do? Well, I finished this morning. Okay. So that's so what, exactly draft. what I intended to do. Yeah. So have a conversation. One of the things that I do want to address, Marlene, is I believe this. And the number one thing that I believe in is personal responsibility. It sounds like a hard thing to say, but one of the things that we do in this society, not that I would defend any politician, we blame politicians. Mm -hmm. Blame ourselves also, because we are responsible for that. We vote, we are citizens, we are educated people in this society. What is it that we're gonna do about change? We live in Belize, we are part of the social contract that is our Belizean society and our Belizean government. Mm -hmm. So we would say, okay, then politician this, politician that, politician that, and we yell at the rain. What is it that we're gonna do to change a society? What is it that we're gonna do to promote a system that brings in better politicians, that makes sure that we focus on poverty reduction and serious programs that can move people forward. That's a conversation that involves all of us. And it's not just saying, you know what, it's the politician's fault. Because if we, and I, re, I experienced this at City Hall, when change wanted to happen and people went, I remember a day that people dumped garbage in front of City Hall and the halls of power moved like lightning that day. Mm -hmm. I remember in several occasions when other things were necessary in the society, the those in government moved very quickly. So why can't we move very quickly about this? We can't because people are not sufficiently angry enough and people will just let I it don't, slide. I don't think it's not that, it's not that they're not angry. You know, and and I, I keep on going back to some of the things I've heard over the past week. When, when the university student says, we have never been taught yeah. how government works. Okay. We have never been taught how to exercise our own powers. I'm using my own words. I'm terrible at quoting. Yeah. But essentially, what she's saying is right. We don't build the level of education that allows people to know what civil participation is, what routes exist. So what do I do with my frustration? What has been the system in Belize? You call in on a radio show, you complain. And then if the politi if it's loud enough and enough people respond, then maybe the politician calls in and you get a remedy. That's how things have been done. Yeah. So I think a part of the challenges and I hear you, you know, you, you that people need to manifest their power. Yeah. But we've never been taught how. No, but okay, so we haven't been taught to do that. So what do we do? Put our heads in the sun? No, yeah. we, we live. I mean, I am very amazed in terms of many societies and situations that I've seen where people make a lot out of very little. Yeah. Again, at City Hall, I used to look at the salaries of individual workers at City Hall and see how small their salaries were. And that person would be raising three children, and their children are very mannerly. And they would make something work out of very little. We have very intelligent and very capable people in our society. We have very intelligent and capable politicians in our society. We have very impressive people in our media. Why is it that we can't, rather than be divided, mm -hmm. focus on just maybe like six things? Is it that we're saying we're going to go the route of the union? We need these six pieces of legislation, and we need an independent investigation. And regardless if you're PUP or UDP or whomever, this is what we want. And we talk about it. If we need to close down our society for a while to get it, then we need it. But we can't come to the same point again and again. Otherwise, we'll never have change. All right, we got, we got quite a bit more to discuss, including uh, taking a look at the legislation that you've drafted. But we'll take a quick break, and we'll be back in a few. When someone you love becomes a memory, the memory becomes a treasure. Channel 5 introduces The Daily Obituaries. The Daily Obituaries will broadcast all death and funeral announcements and memorials to honor your loved one's life and memories. The Daily Obituaries airs on Channel 5 prior to the evening newscast with subsequent repeats at 10 p.m. and 12 noon the following day. It will also be placed online on our social media platforms, all for a standard package fee. Celebrate their lives and memories with Channel 5's daily obituaries. Honor in life and reverence in death. And we're back and we're continuing our 
another conversation uh, with uh, attorney Daryl Bradley, who's also a politician and the president of the Senate. And we've been talking quite a bit about uh, the political atmosphere that's, that's uh, currently, um, that we're currently in. And one of the things that you opened with is that you took the time over the weekend to draft what is a campaign finance legislation yes. that you're hoping to take back to your party and, and hope to be taken seriously and that we see some actual movement mm. towards this. Um, Looking at the time frame that we do have, we don't know when elections is going to be. Um, and it could be as early as two or three months or until the end of the year. Is it practical that something like this can be implemented now? Well, I think that it is very practical. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I drafted it, because having intimate understanding of the legislative process. I've seen legislation pass in like a day. Mm -hmm. and We've all seen it. It yeah. can be a situation where if there is the political will, you can do something. I would say, of course, you have to give notice for certain meetings of the House of Representatives and the Senate. You have to have public consultation, because again, you don't want to ram something down people's throat. Yeah. But I think that if you set a realistic time frame of like a month or at the outside six weeks, we're in the month of February, I would think that by the ending of March or early April, you can get something like this done. It's not very difficult. It's if you have the political will yeah. and the desire to get it done. So what are the elements that are necessary? There are different types of legislations sure. used in different countries. Sure. Um, I think uh, Dickie Bradley was here. Yeah. He spoke a bit of the Jamaican yeah, uh, yeah. legislation. What, what did you use to create yours? Well, I use a lot of examples from the United States, which has a very comprehensive system. Yes. And then they have multiple tiers of government, and yes. they have very uh, detailed disclosure and transparency requirements and so forth. There is legislation from some African countries, including Kenya. There is legislation, as you mentioned, out of the Caribbean. There's also model legislation from various uh, entities like United Nations and so forth. So there's a lot of talk about uh, campaign finance globally. Yeah. And if you notice, like the feature of this legislation talks about two things, specific uh, reporting requirements, but also the concept of ethics mm -hmm. and the concept of the registration of a political party, that all political parties operating within Belize should be registered and you should fall under some sort of oversight. And there would be the requirement for political parties to have like ethics training, for example. Because a lot of this, when you read this, a lot of it maybe. Doesn't local government do training when, when someone is elected? Yes, you do training, but when they... It doesn't include ethics? You've been through the training? The training is something that would be done like one day, which is not what's envisioned here. Mm. And the training would be something that is kind of like an introduction to government. This is your power as mayor. This is your power as an office. This is how you deal with budgets and reporting and so forth, which is mainly administration. So like mm. there is there's training on the administrative work of municipal government. But here what we're talking about is something very specific in terms of campaign finance. And it's very, like for example, something as specific as not using a government vehicle to pick up voters or to drive around to certain, I mean, I wouldn't say necessarily to a po uh, political meeting because if you're an elected official, you can go there. But separating government property and the use of government property from any party political activity. Prohibiting something like, for example, if you have a contractor and that contractor has a contract that is before the government, either for implementation or for tendering and so forth, that person should not give a campaign contribution for a period of at least one year after that contract has been completed making sure that there's specific reporting requirements in relation to all campaign contributions that a political party and a candidate receives either directly or indirectly, something that may be very uh, difficult to fathom also here is the reporting of that and the publication of that. For example, on the United States, I could go on a website and I could check That's out right. how every political party and every candidate spends every dollar that they collect. And you can also see every single contributor as well. Yeah, so that, that's what is in here, so that mm -hmm. you would have to disclose the specific name yeah. and the amount of every person that you're collecting resources from. The idea is that if somebody wants to legitimately give you a, a campaign contribution, then they should be able to say, okay, then I don't, I'm, it's not in secret. I'm going to give you $100. You can put my name on a list, and that list can be filed in a report. The, f yeah. the reality is that we have a lot of things that are going on which is in secret, and we do not know what's going on, yeah. and we don't know necessarily 
cool politicians are beholden to. Mm -hmm. Money in politics is very dangerous. It has broken societies in the world. And we are at a crossroads, and if we can put in place legislation, then the legislation can actually create a better system. You're also calling for a prohibition of, of foreign nationals contributing towards campaign well, finance. Well, I mean, this is a draft. Well, yeah. And it specifically does not include people who are in our diaspora community. Mm -hmm. So that there are a lot of Belizean Americans or Belizean Canadians, Belizeans who live in Europe who would want to fund uh, political campaigns. The important feature here is, though, that you would disclose it. But there's a section which deals with prohib prohibited uh, contributions. So certain people, like a contractor, like somebody who is a regulated uh, entity in certain circumstances, like somebody who really doesn't have any interest in our elections, like a foreign national who has no connection with Belize. Or has a questionable reason as to why they would. Yeah, would. like so, for example, uh, somebody like in this case of Jan Saldiver, that person under this legislation would be disqualified from yeah. giving a contribution because why is it that you're giving our yeah. local politicians? You have no vested interest in mm -hmm. our, our politics. And even if you gave, which is illegal, you would have had to report that contribution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, and I think it's the bigger issue that you mentioned there, which is maybe we, well, we don't discuss very mm -hmm. often how monies given for campaigns mm -hmm. are, uh, how favors may be returned, yes. essentially. Because if I, I give you money to run for your campaign, there is a possibility that perhaps I like you as a candidate, but there is a greater tendency that if I have a business interest or a way that I can profit, that I give you because when you get in power, you'll be indebted to me. No, man. I know I was watching a thing with the United States about this quid pro quo issue. Yeah. And I heard that. I was surprised. When I heard that in Belize, I wanted to fall off my chair. Mm -hmm. oh, but we, but there's we, always, we even no, have uh, quotes from Trump every now and again yeah, from politicians. Yeah, but legislation would presume a quid pro quo. Mm -hmm. Because why is it that you're giving me a campaign donation? Yeah. So, I mean, let's not hide around it. If you are giving me a vote, I'm beholden to that vote. If you're giving me money to procure votes, I'm beholden to the money. So yeah. the issue of regulating campaign finance yeah. is really fundamental to our democratic process. If you, if you eliminate a significant amount of finance within our conversation, then how I will procure your vote? I have to campaign for it. I have to go to your house. I have to talk to you about my programs and my manifesto and my vision. And what this does also, too, is that this tells you that the political party and the politician, the candidate, has to tell you how you're spending the money. So if I collect a million dollars in terms of campaign resources, and I spend $100,000 on ads, and at the end of the campaign, I have zero dollars in my campaign account, which I have to create a campaign account. Where is that $900,000? Mm -hmm. Either I bought votes in terms of that $900, or I converted the money to some personal use, both of which are illegal. Yeah. So that you, it, it allows you to track the money, and it allows you to have a more sensitive and more rational and more well-meaning electoral process. The electoral process in Belize, I would not call it democratic. You have the situation with the differences in terms of electoral divisions, which is a big redistricting, issue. Redistricting, yeah. The redistricting. And then you also have the influence of the procurement of votes through promises, through payment, through whatever. And that system, campaign finance and paying for, that is an undemocratic election. Mm -hmm. Let's not miss the redistricting point. Sure. Do you think that we could redistrict before the next election? Yes. And I think that it is not something, again, that's not, it's difficult, but it's difficult because it's practical. But you have, I mean, you have Wait, scientific. It's difficult because it's practical? Would you because it involves steps that oh. people would have to craft legislation and then you have to do like maps and population and look so that you actually have to make sure that it's done in a scientific, practical way. But there are aids to do that. And in relation to these um, pieces of legislation, likewise, there are lots of international support that you can do that. Like for if you want to do a redistricting uh, exercise, a lot of agencies international will come and assist you to yeah. do that. So it's not something that is and we difficult. We recently it, it had the re-registration as well. There's a yeah. uh, ongoing census process. At least they're about to start. So there is some preliminary information available. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, but, but it goes back to political. I mean, the, the law clearly yeah. states how uh, the distribution should be, and yeah. for a very, very long time, we've known that there has been um, inequity yeah. in 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 the type of power yeah. uh, representation, yeah. especially coming from the city. Yeah. But you see, like that's actually a fundamental issue because the fundamental principle of any democracy is one person, one vote. Yeah. And if you have a constituency that is different in terms of population, like widely different. Yeah. I mean, of course, populations would fluctuate. It's yeah. not every time you have to be doing this. But if there are wide differences and if that's ignored, it would mean that one vote in one area is not weighted yeah. the same as a vote. That's so actually there's, there's a, a, that's, a vote that's a, in this city that is equal to four or five people in yeah, a yeah, rural yeah, yeah. San Creek. Yeah, that, that's a, that's the that's what that's what we're looking at, and and that's somehow a system we're saying that is undemocratic because yeah. the the weighting of votes are very important, especially when you have a first past the post system like we have, yeah. where you have the country divided into a constituency. Constituencies. That's the reason why constituencies have to be near equal because you may have a situation that results in a person or a group of persons quite frequently do not have a majority in the popular vote, but they, um, they manage to secure the government. If they do that because of imbalances in the population of constituencies, that, that renders a situation very undemocratic. Now, in, in, but even beyond that, it's not just about, and that's an important part of it, it's not what my vote uh, is worth versus how many votes it takes yeah, yeah. to equate my vote, it also means resources. It means that whatever is allotted to the person who is managing my area, yeah. I get more than they do. No, that's so, true. so we're just, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're creating a wider gap in the yeah, disparity yeah, yeah, that exists, yeah. especially yeah. the urban rural dynamics. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I will mention in relation to this, which I did not put in the legislation, because that is for discussion and debate, is whether or not you should do, you should balance it with like public resources for campaign financing. Mm -hmm. So that's actually kind of a, but this question of uh, like resource allocation is very, it, it's a significant and uh, important question because I mean, of course, it's not like the government has a lot of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you have like large constituencies in like rural areas, as you had mentioned, where you, you're, you're programming the same amount of monies, that, that's actually, it's, it's unethical in like an economic, in an economic sense, but the, the real issue to my mind would be like a democratic principle that it, it, it's, it's actually something that attacks the very core of what a vote is and the value of an individual vote and whether or not a majority can be defeated by a minority in circumstances where you have one area that has five times as much mm -hmm. as another area. That's actually more likely in terms of uh, an election result. I mean, you've seen that in the past, yeah. but if, this, if the constituencies are equal, it's not a problem. But if its constituencies are four times as much as others, yeah. that's more likely. Yeah. Now, so we, we we're looking at what you've put together in terms of campaign finance um, legislation. You said you, you will present it to your um, party. You know, let's, I think the people in Belize get very inspired when they hear you speak like that because in all honesty, it, you're a bit of an anomaly. Most people don't speak out against or against their parties or uh, are critical of mm -hmm. the political parties that they subscribe to. And very often, we've seen time and time where they just fall in line and continue with whatever prepared speech has, has, has been disseminated. But it has also yeah. put you in a position where, um, I mean, what is your status with the party? I'm sure yeah. you are part of a political party, and we've seen this. We've seen it even more so of recent, where politicians walked into that convention yeah. on that Sunday, rallying behind a person, and you're an attorney, yeah. that everyone knew the yeah. evidence was going to come out. Yeah. Everyone yeah. knew what the outcome was going to yeah. be. But because it was kind of what was expected of them, they followed through yeah. on those same comments yeah. walking in. Yeah, I want to address something that you mentioned earlier. Nothing that I'm saying here is critical. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes. But even saying you're disappointed. We haven't gotten that from any other politician from, from the United Democratic Party. If you ask the average person, they will say the exact same thing. Yeah. That's not unique. So, but what I find is that in our society, we have a problem in accepting different, in different opinions. Mm -hmm. I think that what is 
put forward here. Not that this has to be the legislation. Yeah. This is just something to start the conversation. But I think that what's put forward here is quite nonpartisan, quite universally recognized, if not the specific pieces of the legislation, but the principle of campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm. None of that is, in my view, objectionable. Mm -hmm. And none of that should rob any person the wrong way if likewise they believe in transparent and accountable government. So that when I present something, I don't present it in a way that is against anybody. And even when I'm here, I'm not here saying that I'm doing this for a particular reason. I'm doing this because I believe that this is right. And I believe that at this particular moment in our history, we need it because our country can go down or our country can go up. And it would be the same thing if a different government were in place. It would be the same thing if I were from a different political party. I just think that this is a conversation that we need to have. We're frustrated, but what the heck are we going to do about it? We need some change, and the change has to start somewhere. And I think a good point is that we need some sort of legislation to deal with this. And if people who, like I would speak to, get offended, that, then I mean, like I don't see, like I don't see that as a problem. What what is it that you are supposed to do? God made me as a human being, and He made me as somebody with a mouth. I can't, I can't blame anybody for that. And I'm saying that what is here is not offensive and not confrontational and not given in any spirit that should blame anybody or bring down anybody. This is something I think that our country needs to move in that direction. But don't you also expect the pushback as well? In terms of, I mean, we still have a situation where, you know, this is an election year, mm -hmm. so people are going to be, I would imagine, uh, they're getting into gear to be like, okay, how do we ensure a victory um, politically? Yeah. But at the end of the day, a political victory is you know, for the party, yeah. and we have to be looking at the bigger picture of yeah. how we're going to, uh, yeah. you know, serve but people. This is the whole thing that I would say, and you, you, you kind of mentioned it right there. A political victory, in one sense, does not result in a victory for the Belizean nation. And that's actually what we should be concerned about. And that's what all politicians should be concerned about. What is it that will make our country better in this moment? We know we got problems. To talk about the problems yeah. is to talk about nothing. What is it that we can do now? And if you're going to say that we need a election in terms of that's going to be like in a short period of time, we have a lot of things that are uh, on the agenda in terms of dealing with. This is something that if we focus on this for a month, we can get it done. So if you want to really say that, you know what, we're about leadership and we are about transparency and we're about meaning well for people, yeah. then let's begin the conversation about getting something in place within a short period of time. Pushback, fallback, criticism, rubbing people the wrong way, that's actually not important. It's not really important about like me saying it. It's actually important that we do this. Like, so you kind of are asking about um, like getting pushback or criticism or whatever. Like, I don't worry about that. I actually worry about, you know what? My son, Nathan, and my daughter, Sunisa, people, I think, Marlene, you asked me this question. B BTL Park is good. I built the park for a selfish reason. I built the park because I like to take my children there. I want to have this law passed for a selfish reason, because I want my children to grow up in a country where they can have freedom and they can have confidence in their democratic process. I have seen countries that fail. I, when I was at City Hall, we benefited a lot from the goodwill of the Venezuelan people. And now you have people exiting Venezuela. Why? Because of leadership issues. And you have many countries in the world where leadership has caused wars and it has caused chaos. We do not want that. We have a very small, vulnerable society. And at some point, we need to say enough is enough. Let's do things differently and let us just look at the legislation mm -hmm. and see if it is appropriate and see whether or not we can agree and pass it. And I think it also um, puts Belize uh, part of the greater international conversation. Because if we look about politically what's trending globally, Massive protests um, we saw in 2019, continuing dealing with, into and, and they're still continuing. And you know, South America, the Middle East, all different places, and a lot, and even in the United States to a certain extent now, because um, if you know, you had mentioned Bernie Sanders earlier, and uh, the a chief concern in several democratic countries is uh, talking about campaign finance, talking about whose interests are being served yeah. when uh, a party does get into power, because of course. 
people, um, you know, we have campaign financing people who put you there, you become beholden to them, so. They call back the favors. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we actually, but it's, sorry. Okay, so let me, let me just be the cynic. Sure. You are a member of the United Democratic Party. Yes. They are the ones with the power, they have the majority, yes, 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 yes. to take this into the yeah. House by the yeah. end of the week and say, we are serious. Yeah. You are here in the public medium, and I, and I do appreciate that, having this conversation. How effective do you think you're going to be when you sit down with, I mean, who are you going to sit with? The Attorney General, the Solicitor yeah. General, uh, no, Prime Minister yeah, himself. But How effective do you feel you're going to be when you take this there? I think that the conversation will be very difficult, because we all know that. I mean, it's a, but the problem is, and this is why I think it's a fundamental problem in our society, this is not my responsibility. It is not my but responsibility. But you took the initiative, yes. Yeah, because change and has to start somewhere. But this is every single, if you go, because politicians will be walking around right now and knocking on people's doors, and if you go and you say to your politician, your ear representative or whomever, that I will only give you my vote if there is campaign finance reform, and you make sure that you vote for that, I guarantee you this will, um, this will pass. The problem in our society is that, okay, then, well, it's uh, Daryl Bradley putting that. So we already have a label because it comes from a UDP, so we now support that. So well, what am I saying is that it has to be a conversation, that it, there has to be something that all of us must be able to agree on. They, and I think that one of that issue, or one of those issues, has to be ethics in government. Like that has to be something that, regardless of where you are. So this is not a conversation that only I should have. I'm going to share this with a lot of social partners. Yes. I have the benefit of working with social partners in the Senate. I'm going to share it with them. I'm going to start a conversation with all well-meaning people that this is what we need to do. This is the direction that we need to take our country. And it's not my responsibility. It's not only that conversation I will have with the Attorney General or whomever. But if we start to just push on the positive, push on things that we need to reform us, then it's going to happen. And it's going to happen not a month from now or six months from now. It's going to happen, it's going to happen next week or like within a few weeks. Now, given what's taking place in your party, they have other priorities right now as well, well which is creating, finding a, a leader for the party. That's actually not important. I mean, it's really not... It's imp politically important for them. It's not important for the country. I mean, I, I'm, I'm being real here. I mean, in terms of what really, if you ask the average Belizean what really is important to them, they will tell you they don't really care who really runs the country. They want to make sure that the country is run in a proper way so that they can have food on the table. That's what's important. But I think they'll also say they want better options on their ballot paper, and they want a better option in terms of leadership. I so I, I, want, I want to go to I want to go to that though. Let's 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 indulge us a bit in, sure. in the political realm. Um, we've seen where uh, the party has taken a week to be able to come back to a national party council to <laughs> put forward names. Um, wh what are you expecting in terms of who will step forward in leadership? In the leadership? leadership, yeah. Well, <laughs> actually, I don't know what to. Do expect. you have a preference? Not particularly, but I have a preference and two things that move me. A person's vision for a country and a person's stance on public ethics. Mm -hmm. Those are the two issues. And I think those are the two issues that would guide me in terms of a national election and then a party council election. We have to recognize that we have problems and we need to deal with those problems. And we need people who can deal with those problems, meaning that they have the heart to deal with those problems and they have the ability to deal with those problems. So I'm not really... You don't mm -hmm. have a person in mind who possess those qualities I'm not within the party well, at the moment who are eligible? Yeah, well, I was, I was going to ask then what, um, you know, what sort of, you know, can you give any examples of perhaps some specific things that in terms of a vision yeah. that would resonate with you and would, you know, give you um, hope in that? Well, I would think that if there is individuals from any political party who would champion reform right now. We've talked about political reform in this country before. There have been movements, but it's very been slow to occur. I remember the, the 13th senator. Mm -hmm. That was like years in the making, even yeah. though many, many years ago that was on a paper and they recommended a 13th senator. If you bring back those political reform recommendations today, it'd be interesting many of to them, majority. Many of them are in here. And one of the things that I always uh, look at, I have had the benefit of gone, going to uh, observer mission, election observer missions. And campaign finance is something they always put mm -hmm. on their reports for Belize. Like this is going back maybe like 10 or 15 years. So it's actually nothing unusual. And if somebody can actually say, hey, you know what? These are the things that we need. Yeah. These are the things that we need. 
then I think that that's very important. Well, I think you, you, you've done the work in terms of putting the legislation together, and I hear your call repeatedly where the people kind of have to take up the mantle at this point in time. Um, I think we all recognize that there's a level of frustration that people feel, you know. Uh, the UNCAC is a great example. The teachers shut down for, uh, protested for many days yeah. to be able to get the ratification of the UNCAC, but the process had just be stalled. And I, I feel that it's things like that that take place that um, have people feel that their powers have been diminished. But you are right. It is important for us to recognize that we have to be solution oriented and we have to find a way to get the solutions yeah. and get the people who can do it to follow through. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, and uh, I, I do want to close off, of course, because I know I'm sure the conversation has started already. People have looked at you and said, why don't you enter the leadership race? Um, I know there are, uh, you're, you're not a member of the House of Representatives, which is the primary reason. Yeah. You still have those aspirations, though, yeah. right? Yes, yeah, yeah. What's the long-term plan for you? Well, I mean, the long-term plan would hopefully seek some elected office in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's kind of a thing which I think is kind of very important. I mean, I have always come on your show, and I've mentioned it before. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's where I see. I mean, it's kind of uncertain and hazy, but yeah. nonetheless. You see yourself going back into Caribbean shores? Mm, maybe. I mean, it's, it's, you do like certain calculations as to like, whether or not you're going to win, what would, be the, uh, what would be the specifics of it and so forth, and then you kind of decide what you, uh, like, you want to do. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for coming in and having the conversation this morning. Thank you. All right. We're going to go ahead and take a break, and we'll be talking about a men's conference after the break. <laughs> <laughs>